Our speaker, Dr. Mordechai Gadar, is an Israeli scholar of Arabic culture and is one of the, uh, Israel's leading figures uh, in understanding the Middle East and the Arab world. He is a frequent speaker in Israeli, Arab, and international media. Dr. Kadar is director of the Center for the Study of Middle East and is a research associate at the Begin Sadat Center for Strategic Studies, both at Bar Ilan University, Ramat Gan, Israel. Dr. Kadar is also assistant professor with Bar Ilan University. He served in IDF military intelligence for 25 years, specializing in Arab political discourse, Arab mass media, Islamic groups, Syria, and Israeli, Israeli Arabs, and was head of a branch in IDF's Unit 8200. The Unit 8200 is probably the foremost technical intelligence agency in the world and stands on a par with the US's National Security Agency. Dr. Gadar holds the rank of Lieutenant Colonel in the IDF Reserves. He is fluent in Hebrew, English, and Arabic, and holds a BA in Arabic and Political Science, and a PhD um, in Arabic from Bar Ilan University. It is a, truly an honor of mine to welcome Dr. Gadar. Thank you, Dr. Gadar. Thank you so much, Sheldon. And I thank uh, Kobe for arranging it. And of course, I thank uh, the ZOA, and, uh, uh, and of course, the, the man who is behind the ZOA or in front of the ZOA, uh, Maud Klein, uh, my good friend, uh, really a very, very, you know, organization which makes us Israelis feel that we are not alone in this uh, uh, forest or desert named the Middle East. Thank you so much for what you do. And th thank you so much for what you are. Ladies and gentlemen, only uh, six hours ago, we saw on TV a magnificent production of the ceremony in the White House. And I, I don't know if you noticed, but there were some groups of flags, four flags uh, in every group. One is the, on the left, it was the American flag. Then came the Bahraini one. Then came the Israeli one. And on the right, there was the Emirati one. Means Israel is between the Emirates and the Bahrainis. Something like cuddled, like surrounded. You can say also maybe protected, but somebody there thought it was not, uh, you know, just like this, because all the groups of flags, and I think I, I saw at least 10 of these groups of four flags. They were exactly the same order, all the 10 uh, more or less groups. So somebody here thought about the order of these flags, and it was too obvious, uh, this uh, setup. Then what you could very, very easily see, the atmosphere, which was there, uh, beyond the words, beyond the, the texts, which were very significant, uh, you could see how people there are smiling. They, their body language was so clear that they are actually enjoying what they do there. And uh, for this, you have to, we have to understand uh, the uh, two or, or three former events which were also on the loan of the White House. The one was uh, in 1979 in the signing of the a peace agreement in, in, between Israel and Egypt. And the president was Jimmy Carter those days, and the Israeli Prime Minister Begin and Sadat. Uh, and we all remember the handshake of the three people together, six hands uh, together. Then we saw uh, in 1993, the. Uh, and the eve of Rosh Hashanah as well. Um, it was between Clinton, the president, Rabin, the late Rabin, in, in the, the Israeli prime minister, and Arafat, who signed the Oslo agreements. Again, handshake of six, of, uh, six hands, three people. 
Then it came in the Arava Valley near Eilat in 1994, in October of 1994. Clinton again with uh, Rabin and King Hussein signing the uh, peace agreement between Israel and Jordan. Again, the handshake of the three people. Today, unfortunately, they couldn't shake their hands physically because of the coronavirus and the criticism. I, I, I believe that the Trump would do it, but uh, Netanyahu, if Netanyahu do it, he would do it, uh, people will crucify him here uh, for shaking hands after he tells everybody, don't shake hands, just go with your elbows, the maximum. You know, coronavirus, you heard about it, right? So, uh, so they could not produce this picture again of uh, shaking, and this time, eight hands because of four people. So they stood there, and this was enough. Uh, so this was, I, I would say, some kind of, uh, uh, something which apparently uh, Trump didn't like, but this is what can be done. Um, this is one thing. And another thing which should uh, uh, be, be uh, the, the, attention be, the attention should be drawn to is the phrasing and the wording. And here I would like to, to, to concentrate on one word, which was said by the Minister of Foreign Affairs of the Emirates. Uh, Abdallah, uh, uh, you know, the, the minister. He mentioned that this document, which they are actually signing today, in Arabic is Mu'ahadat Salam. Salam is peace. Mu'ahada is not an agreement. Mu'amada is much more than agreement. It's like a treatise. It's like um, something way above an agreement. And when he said this, my ears jumped because using this word to describe what was signed today actually means that they see the whole thing from a totally different point of view. To compare the peace between Israel and, the, and Egypt, in 1979, and the peace between Israel and Jordan in 1994 were signed between countries who had bloody wars between them. With Egypt, we had the 1948 and 1956, 1967, and then 69 and 70, the attrition war. And then we had the 1973, the bloody war. And many people on both sides, the Israeli side and the Egyptian side, lost their lives, and uh, people lost their brothers, fathers, sons, and the sediments of these, uh, 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 these wars in the population were more than clear. Until this very day, people go with psychological scars because of those wars. Either they were injured or lost uh, a, a family member and so forth. So now making peace, Three years after the last, the last uh, or four years after the last uh, war, it was definitely a skeleton in the room or the elephant in the room, the wars and the casualties. The same thing with, with Jordan. We had several wars with them until 67. So uh, definitely the background of these, of the peace between these two countries is a very bloody background. This explains why the peace between these two countries with Israel has not yet exceeded the level of non-belligerence with embassies. Not much more. It's a cold, cold peace restricted to very low grade or low key of relations. No tourists, no investments, no academic exchange, no cultural exchange, no nothing. Only uh, 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 embassies, ambassadors, uh, here and there cooperation on uh, security because it's important for both countries, and maybe here and there a little economic uh, exchange and nothing but. And this is because of the background of the history between Israel and these two countries. With the Emirates, we don't have any such background. We never had a war with them. We never had any struggle over borders or refugees or anything with them. So actually, it's not 
a peace after a war, it is a mutual recognition, more or less. So th this makes the peace with these Gulf states, I'm talking about the, the, the seven Emirates, united in the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain of today. And uh, so with them, the talks and the negotiations were much easier because of the absence of the resentment and the memories and the sediments of the wars which we, which we had with Egypt and Jordan, and we have to take this uh, in account. Add to this the fact that uh, actually these two count these countries uh, uh, are, were actually pushed uh, to is towards Israel by the geopolitical situation of the Middle East, which was shaped during the last more or less five, six years. What do I mean? You might remember the years of the Cold War, which Europe was divided between the, the NATO pact and the Warsaw pact. Group of countries in Western Europe, including the United States of America, and on the other side, the group of countries of Eastern Europe led by Russia, uh, by, by the Soviet Union, actually. Here in the Middle East, we actually have the same divide, the same thing. On one side, we see a pact of countries headed by Iran, includes Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, Qatar, Turkey, and Gaza. All are more or less in the same camp uh, of the Iranian, backed by Russia and China, as we see in the United Nations time and again. On the other side, you see another pact of countries, Saudi Arabia, the, Emirate, the United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Egypt, Jordan, Israel, and the North Africa, North African countries to some degree, except for Libya. Libya has its own problems domestically. So you, here you see actually two pacts in the Arab world, which is sharply divided between the countries which are which follow Iran, whether by will or by uh, uh, hostile takeover, which happened in like in, in, in Syria or in, uh, or in Iraq, versus another pack of countries headed by Saudi Arabia and backed by the United States of America. And when the geopolitical divide of the Middle East is such, Israel, could very easily become part of those who share the fear from Iran. And this is actually what pushed these two countries of today, and very possibly in the near future, Saudi Arabia as well, probably uh, uh, Oman, the Sultanate of, of Oman, maybe Sudan, uh, or, maybe, or maybe also uh, some sub-Saharan African countries, which are not Arab countries, but Islamic countries, like Mali, Chad. And Netanyahu visited Chad, an uh, 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 official visit. So, you know, it's also on its way. Mauritania, we have relations already. So here we are, Israel, instead of being the problem of the Arab world, becomes the solution of part of the Arab world against the other part of the Arab world, which follows the Iranian hegemon. So this is more or less the geopolitical situation of the Middle East, uh, which found itself uh, on the loan of the White House, because you could see uh, representatives of some countries which support the peace agreement. And believe me, the, neither the Emirates nor Bahrain would do anything with Israel without the consent of the Saudi Arabians. And Saudi Arabia here actually is the uh, 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 much, the, the, the 
most influential country in the Arab, in the Arab Peninsula. So definitely, these two countries had a very clear, very clear uh, 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 green light to, to go forward with Israel uh, uh, to this agreement which was signed uh, uh, today. And, not in, and this is actually what pushed them together. Because we never saw two, can, two Arab countries in one ceremony, uh, in a, uh, one month apart from uh, uh, this whole process. Between Egypt and, and, and Jordan, we had, uh, uh, what, 15 years. So here we are. And the, the question is actually, uh, what is the, is this peace only between the governments as it is between Israel and the, and the Egypt and, and, and Jordan? Or is it something between the nations, between the streets, between the people themselves? And here definitely we can see today that the atmosphere in the streets, let alone the governments, in the streets is totally different. First of all, because as, as I said, there is no background of bloodshed between Israel and the Emirates. However, what, we, what you can very easily see that uh, uh, already I myself, I got through Twitter and I am active in the Arabic Twitter uh, because I speak Arabic. Uh, I already got today like three or four private messages by, by Twitter offering me to be a liaison for them vis-a-vis uh, -vis Israeli companies which uh, they are willing to, to create uh, relations with. Already, they are, they are willing to buy or sell or cooperate with Israeli companies. Look, officially, already a month ago, it was announced, officially announced, that the Emirates actually invest in research for a vaccine for the corona. In Israel, an Israeli company, along with another institution, develops a, a vaccine for the uh, for the corona, and the money in it is a, a money which comes from the Emirates, and it was uh, announced like a day after the announcement uh, in August of the uh, forthcoming uh, signing, which happened today. So already between the governments, you can definitely see. A, a cooperation on uh, research, on financing, and all these things. A group of uh, bankers from Israel went to, to uh, Abu Dhabi and Dubai in order to open the gates for uh, uh, money transfer, you know, uh, payments and so forth, uh, credit cards. Uh, the cell phone companies already have their counterparts in the Emirates in order to enable people with Israeli phones to roam in, uh, in the Emirates, and the Emirates will give the support for the Israeli cell phones. So here, here we are, we, we have already, uh, before even the signing of the agreement, uh, we have relations which are way much warmer than what we have with Egypt after 41 years of peace. So here 41 hours <laughs> were <laughs> where uh, much more achievements were made by in 41 hours, you know, just to use the name, the same number, than in 41 years with Egypt. Okay, so this is something from a different level, and actually they called it tatbir in Arabic, which is normalization. And in modern Arabic, normalization is a bad word. It's some kind of accusation against whoever wants to I would say, go to bed with, Israel, with the Israelis. It's a bad word, which was created by the Palestinians mainly, in order to label all those who want to cooperate with, the, with Israel in a very bad label. And they have no problem to declare, yes, we are normalizing the, the, uh, the relations with Israel and let the Palestinians jump in the lake. And this is actually what uh, the Emiratis say. Uh, I myself, in order to, to check what happens in the streets, in Twitter, as you might know, you can very easily create a poll by yourself. You, you click uh, uh, make a poll, you phrase the question, 
you phrase the answers A, B, and C, and say send, and this, there is a poll, and you, you, you say for how many days, one to seven days. I created for seven days a poll uh, 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 what, with the question, what do you think about the hashtag, uh, Israel is not my enemy? Okay, and, and this is in Arabic. Means, what do you think about this idea that Israel is not my enemy? Uh, 6,000 people bothered to answer, which is a very big number. 6,000 answered from all over the Arab world. 54% of them uh, wrote that they are against it. Means 54% of the people between 20 and 30, which is the majority of the users of Twitter, 54% of them still think, feel that Israel is their enemy. 34% means a third of this age group said that they agree with this. Means that they agree that Israel is not their enemy. A third, a third of the Arab world, if this is something which can be relied on. Another 11%, or the rest of the 11%, said that they do not know. They have doubts. They don't know exactly. Ladies and gentlemen, this is an earthquake in the Arab world. If I made this uh, poll five years ago, I would get a zero of those who agree with such a hashtag that Israel is not my enemy. Today, mainly thanks to some elements which I will, I will show. The public opinion about Israel is such that three, uh, the one, one of three of the Arabs have no problem to say that Israel is not my enemy. This is a major change. Now, what made this change? First of all, as I mentioned, the Iranian threat. Many, many Arabs, especially in the eastern part of the Arab world, means Saudi Arabia, the Emirates, Kuwait, uh, Iraq, of course, uh, are very much afraid of the Iranian uh, uh, influence and the Iranian terror and whatever. The Iranian is devastating their countries, as we see in Yemen, in Iraq, in Syria, Lebanon, of course, and uh, uh, Libya not, but uh, uh, definitely they are afraid of the Iranians. Secondly, uh, the failure of the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring, which started uh, almost 10 years ago, uh, at the beginning was accompanied with very, very high hopes about democracy, human rights, political freedoms, uh, free press, and all these things which uh, they were longing for for many years. But unfortunately, the, what started this big hope of the Arab Spring became Daesh, means the ISIS, became total destruction like it, it is in Syria, in Iraq, in Yemen, in Libya. Sudan is divided because of the long war. And um, look, and the number of casualties, ladies and gentlemen, only in Syria, something like a million people got killed. Who knows how many millions were injured? Uh, at least 10 million people are refugees, either inside Syria, running away from place to place, or in Jordan, uh, Lebanon, Turkey, Europe, America, wherever they went. Like a third or even more of the, third of, of, of the population. And Israel is not the cause. So Israel is not the enemy of Syria. The same thing is in Iraq. People kill each other only because you are a Sunni and I am a Shia and so forth. Or you are an Arab and I am a Kurd. Uh, what happens in Libya? Is this because of Israel? And what happens in, in Lebanon? Is this because of Israel? It's because Hezbollah took the country over. So people today understand it took them 10 years. But finally they understood that Israel is not their enemy. Their enemy is the rulers or the, 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 the jihadists who devastate the, the war only because they pray in a, in a different style, like Nosach Sfarad, Nosach Ashkenaz. Okay? So, so Israel is not an enemy. Today, third of the Arab world uh, uh, believes in it, according to this uh, uh, poll. Another thing which 
uh, uh, today uh, enabled what happened today is the fact that the Palestinian problem, the Palestinian issue became something either non-existent or in the margin. First of all, every country now cares for, for herself, not for the Palestinians. Secondly, the Palestinians actually uh, earned this attitude uh, by their own division, the division between the PLO and Hamas. And look, in the Arab media, you, you could see like every other day, and now, and, uh, somebody from the PA, from the Palestinian Authority, from Ramallah speak, speaking, and another one from Gaza. And they are cursing each other in front of the whole Arab world in Arabic. And they are blaming each other for, the, for this divide. And they are actually throwing mud at each other in front of the whole Arab world. So the Arab world just got sick of these people who cannot agree on anything. So if they cannot agree on anything, why should we uh, care for them if they cannot uh, make peace with them and fight the Israelis, whatever? whatever. So they actually uh, made themselves some kind of a burden for the Arab world, which they don't want to carry anymore. Add to this the fact that the main anchor of Al Jazeera, a guy named Jamal Rayyan, a Palestinian by, by birth, uh, re recently, and, and he is a Hamasnik, he is a Muslim Brotherhood, and, and Jazeera definitely is part of the Iranian pact, uh, because it's Boskas from Qatar. Uh, recently, uh, it was found out that his father was selling lands to Jews in the Sharon area, to the north from Tel Aviv. He sold the Jews, before the state was established, thousands of dunams. Excuse me now, and, and, and the Arabs now say, your father, you, the guy, the guy who brought us with Jazeera and keeps asking us to go and free Palestine. Your father sold land to the Jews and you want us to go and kill ourselves in order to liberate Palestine and give, them, give Palestine back to you after your father sold it to the Jews? Okay, so this, you know, they don't want to be uh, such a yo-yo in the hands of, uh, of uh, somebody whose father sold uh, the land to the Jews and now he is weeping and whining for the Arabs to go and liberate Palestine. And this is another thing which make the Palestinians something like persona non grata in this issue. A another thing which uh, uh, encouraged the, the Emirates to come to Israel and, and make such a peace with Israel is what happened after the, the moving of the American embassy to Jerusalem. Before it happened, uh, the, all the speakers of the Arab world said, ah, the, the whole, the, the sky will fall on the earth and a big war will come. And, and, and you know, the, the rhetoric was so vociferous about this. However, after the embassy was, was moved to Jerusalem in 2018, nothing happened. Not even one embassy of the United States in the Arab world was closed. Not even one ambassador was kicked out. Nothing happened, and, and, and as much as I remember, uh, not even one terror attack against, against Americans was initiated because of this thing. So the Emirates said, people are talking, people are shouting and screaming, but nothing will be done. So let's go forward with this. Uh, so this is something in which they uh, 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 remember. Uh, another thing is uh, that uh, youngsters in the Arab world today are very far or getting more and more further from the Arab ethos of the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, that Israel is a knife in the back of the Arab nation, and uh, we have to fight the Zionists until our last drop of blood. All these uh, uh, components of the Arab uh, thoughts about Israel it, these things do not talk anymore to the, to the youngsters in the Arab world who want to live, want to make living, especially today after the coronavirus destroyed much of the uh, workplaces which they were making living on.
like, like in many other countries as well, including the United States and Israel as well. And the Arab world also suffers from the same unemployment and so forth. So they are unemployed, they don't have money, they cannot eat, they don't, cannot sustain their, their families. And now what? Shall we go and liberate Palestine? What, what do you mean? We have to take care of our own souls. Okay, so th this is an atmosphere today that uh, 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 people are not willing to go to any war because their real war is to survive vis-a-vis. -vis. And the last component which definitely helped this atmosphere is actually ISIS. I, I, I don't know how much you guys are aware of what ISIS created, but as a result of ISIS, anyone today in the Arab world who speaks about killing, eradicating, Fighting is associated with, da with Daesh, with ISIS, because they were killing, they were destroying, and they were, you know, fighting. And today it's very easy to label anyone who wants to go and fight as somebody who gets his ideas from ISIS. And ISIS today is something which not even one Arab you know, very few would identify with because they know the damage which ISIS brought to Arabs, to Muslims, uh, before the others, before the infidels, before the Jews, and before the, the Christians. 95% of the casualties of, of ISIS were Muslims. And this is a shameful thing, which they are so much ashamed because of this. So today, to say that you are going to fight the Jews people immediately look at you as some kind of an ISIS remnant which still uh, talks about these things. So uh, when all these components come together from the Iranian and what happened with the Palestinian issue and so forth, it is not, it, you shouldn't be surprised that what happened today was under totally different atmosphere compared to the peace agreements which we had with both Egypt and uh, and uh, uh, Jordan. And if we go to our subject, uh, as, as you know, the blast in, in, in Beirut is also mentioned there. And here it comes to the picture. What happens here actually today in the last month since the explosion in Beirut, which now everybody knows that this was materials, but not only uh, 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 the nitrate, uh, ammonia nitrate, which was there. It was also ammunition and missiles and explosives and missile fuel, which is very combustible. Everything there, and when you analyze the, the video clips which came from that blast, you can very easily see in some of them the, uh, the explosions of the ammunition between the big blasts. So, uh, and everybody blames uh, Hezbollah because everybody knows how Hezbollah uh, acted in the port in like in its own backyard and did whatever they like. They stored whatever they like in, in, in this uh, port and what blew up was the ammunition and of course that ammonium nitrate as well. Uh, and this actually what was exactly a month ago. What we have today is a peace agreement uh, uh, signed by these two countries with Israel. And these two pictures actually uh, 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 resemble the Middle East. On one side, you have the pact of the Iranian uh, country and their uh, uh, tales in Iraq, in Syria, and in Lebanon, and Turkey and all the others which what they bring to the people, explosions. And people are killed, you know, in that almost 200 people got killed immediately and thousands were injured and the destruction in Beirut, God forbid. So, okay, on one side you see the coalition of destruction, coalition of explosions, coalitions of wars, coalition of, uh, uh, of bloodshed on one side and on the other side countries which want prosperity, which want life, which want good health, 
which want to cooperate with each other, which want to open a new window to the future, which will give everybody uh, what, he, what he needs, especially cure from the coronavirus and so forth. And this is actually what, I, I, for my, in my view, the significance of what happened today. We create life, hope, future, while they are immersed in this swamp of wars, bloodshed, and explosions. And this is actually what happened. However, with this optimistic uh, 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 remark, I should also remind everybody that we already had uh, agreements with two Arab countries, uh, Qatar and Tunisia. And these agreements, which were not complete peace, it was, it was uh, establishing commercial representations in both countries, but with the Israeli flag in the street. These two countries canceled the agreement, these agreements, uh, after the eruption of the Second Intifada in late 2000. Means peace agreements, like other agreements, uh, countries can withdraw from them. And we see this also in the States, how President Trump decided to withdraw from the JCPOA with Iran and from NAFTA and from other. Okay, so um, different governments of different uh, policies and the peace agreement which was signed now might be changed, altered, reduced. Uh, uh, there are all kinds of ways. So we, it is not something which is written on the rock like uh, Rochmore Mountain, okay? It is something which could be flexible because as you know, in the Middle East, the sand dunes change their uh, position according to Matsav Haruach, the position of the wind or the moon. Dr. Kedara, thank you. Yeah. Um, we have uh, fascinating, we just have many uh, uh, great uh, questions which I think uh, um, we would like you to, to answer. Yeah, yeah, I I'll just finish with one more sentence. This is one thing, so we sh should always, always bear in mind the possibility that some things might be changed in spite of the signing. Second thing we should always remind, remind that in agreements, there are some things which are coming in small print or in a clandestine agreements or supplements. I want to know exactly what was signed on, what, what, is, what is the small print, and what, if there is something which is a secret, which is still kept in secret. Until I know everything, I cannot be decisive about this uh, agreement. I hope that within the few days, we'll know all the details. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the situa situation today. We already start with cooperations, and this actually gives us a good hope for Shana Tova, means a good year which will start in four days from today. Thank you so much, and I will take questions. Okay, so um, we'll take questions in, uh, in about 30 seconds. Uh, we have uh, many good questions. Hi everybody, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Kobe Harris. I'm the executive director for uh, ZOA uh, Michigan. I was born and raised in Israel and served in, in the Israeli army. Um, I just wanted to give you a quick update before we take the questions. Um, as you know, we here at ZOA, we, we fight for Israel. Um, if you look at the organizations who, who are anti-Israel, and especially the Jewish ones, uh, the New Israel Fund has uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in budget. Just in the last few years, they, uh, they funded um, anti-Israel groups um, with $80 million, including an organization that is called Moked. It's an organization in Israel that um, represents, legally represents terrorists, uh, Palestinian terrorists who murdered Jews. Um, there is J Street, who is heavily funded, including George Soros, uh, who, who is pushing to, uh, who pushed to condemn Israel in the United Nations and also pushed for the Iran nuclear deal to happen during the Obama administration. And of course, we have the uh, Black Lives, uh, Black Lives uh, Movement, um, which is uh, very anti-Israel. Um, and if you look at the rest of the Jewish organizations, or most of them, um, they are ignoring at best, or if not supporting, the, the, uh, the anti-Israel organization. ZOA is here to voice um, 
uh, really a lone voice uh, in a sea of, uh, of organizations that are silent when anti-Semitism is rampant, when the anti-Israel sentiment is rampant. Um, things are happening at, at universities every day that people don't know about, and ZOA is there, our legal team is there to help, including Duke University, University of Michigan, North Carolina University. We are there to fight the BDS movement, which is very dangerous. And if, uh, if you look at the um, history uh, in Germany, when you had Nazi SS soldiers stand in front of stores, preventing people from going and buying from Jewish stores, uh, this is happening today. Uh, they don't have a gun in their hand, but they, they, they have a lot of money and they have a lot of resources and they are pushing to boycott Israel, to boycott Israel because the people are in Israel are mostly Jewish. So we, we ask you, uh, there's only a few months left for the year. We ask you for your support. This is not an easy time, especially because of Corona. Um, your support, every dollar counts. We make every dollar count. Um, and uh, we please ask you to go to mizoa.org to donate or donate to your region or donate nationally at zoa.org. Um, and with that, I will start with the, the first question. Uh, the first question uh, uh, is from our president, Sheldon Feilich. Uh, Dr. Kida, how much is the Israel Bahrain uh, agreement is due to uh, President Trump's influence? Uh, I think that uh, all the Emirates, not only the Bahrain, also the, the uh, Emirates, uh, do rely on America if things deteriorate between the Gulf and Iran. They rely on America. Don't, don't forget that they have the fifth fleet in Bahrain, uh, and uh, they have, in Qatar, of course, they have an, an airport named al Idid, which also has uh, an American uh, Air Force. So they do rely on America, and they assume that if they give uh, this peace under the American uh, uh, sponsorship, uh, America will be, there, will be with them when America is needed to deter or to do what, what, what should be done with Iran if they are attacked. Uh, they might even think that uh, by signing the, 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 the peace agreement now, before the elections in the States, they actually increase the chances that th President Trump will be reelected because uh, some Americans would like uh, to be, you know, would like to support a man who brought the peace in the Middle East in such a way. Uh, whether it's uh, uh, with basis or baseless, I have no idea but they uh, definitely would do anything in order to make sure that Trump remains in office because they know, they suspect, or they are afraid that if there is a change in the White House, uh, you know, the JCPOA, America will go back to the, uh, the agreement with Iran, uh, will lift all the sanctions from Iran, and this, uh, they feel that they are threatened by this, and they will make peace with the Satan if he could uh, make sure that uh, Trump remains in the White House for additional four years. And uh, then next question is from uh, Len Getz, a uh, ZOA national board member. At the uh, signing, the representative from the UAE thanked Trump for halting Israel's annexation of Palestine Palestinian lands. Uh, what do you have to say about that? Do you think it's a fair concession? Also, that leads into the question of uh, Malka Lippmann, who is asking, what other concessions besides the sovereignty do you think uh, is, is going on? And, um, and what is more important, annexation or the, uh, the peace with the UAE? Uh, it's not annexation. the annexation. If the annexation, first of all, just You're to right. remind everybody. You're right, the, okay, we're, we're into sovereignty, we're not annexation, thank you. Of course, it's, a, it's, it's, it's to exercise, not to, to exercise, your sovereignty, because as you might know, uh, this land between the Jordan Valley and the sea was given to the Jewish people, to you and me uh, alike, uh, already by the League of Nations in 1920. And since all the decisions of the League of Nations were adopted by the United Nations, this is still valid until this very day. So it, it belongs to the Jewish people anyway. So we don't have to, uh, 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 to spread our 
our uh, uh, sovereignty, we have it already. But we don't exercise it, and this is the problem. Uh, I think that uh, Israel should do anything uh, in order to prevent the establishing of a Palestinian state on Judea and Samaria, because such a state will be a terror state inevitably. Uh, because of various reasons, Hamas already won the elections in 2006, and it can happen again and again and again and again. So if we establish a Palestinian state, uh, it can turn into another Hamastan, either by elections, as happened already in January 2006, or by a coup d'etat, as happened in, in, in Gaza in June of 2007. So between the elections and the coup d'etat, the West Bank or the Judean Samaria or Palestinian state on that area will definitely turn into a, another Hamastan. And neither Israel needs it, and not, and not America, and nobody in the world needs it. Another Hamastan. So what Israel should do, actually, is dismantle the PA and establish the eight uh, Palestinian Emirates. Uh, you can Google for it, and you can find the solution, which I came out or heard it like uh, 15 years ago, based on the clans of every city. An Emirate in the Arab part of Hebron, another Emirate in Jericho for the uh, Arikat clan, another one in, in, for the Baguti in Ramallah, another one in Shechem, in Nablus, another one in Tulkarem, another one in Kalkilia, in addition to the Emirate which was established 13 years ago in Gaza. And this is a state, whether we like it or not. So this is the only sort of the Emirate paradigm, which is a successful paradigm, versus the conglomerate state which exists in the Middle East, like Syria and Iraq, which bring these countries, or a Palestinian state, as well to the abyss. So this is the solution, the only solution. And therefore, since Israel should remain forever in the rural areas, we should uh, uh, exercise our sovereignty, which was given to us by the international community already 100 years ago. Um, next question is, why is the, from Deborah Glazer, what is the policy of Qatar, why is the policy of Qatar so different than the UAE and Bahrain? Why is Qatar seemingly aligned with Iran? Um, is its population mostly Shiite? No, uh, Qatar, and not only they are Arabs and they are Sunnis, they are actually Wahhabis, just like Saudi Arabia. However, it didn't prevent the big hatred between Saudi Arabia and Qatar. First of all, and the reasons are, first of all, uh, uh, Qatar shares the biggest gas field in the world with Iran, half and half. So Iran, with its 80 million people, gets half, while Qatar, with its 80,000 people, <laughs> get the other. So not exactly this number, but just to clear numbers. Okay? Get the other half. So they, they, they share with Iran the same thing, and they are afraid that if they uh, actually um, act against the Iranian will, the Iranians will take everything, and uh, nobody can fight the Iranians today. So the Qataris will remain without their main source of income. It is one thing. Second thing is Qatar became a country which supports the Muslim Brotherhood, the most vile enemy of the Emirates and Saudi Arabia. And Qatar supports the Muslim Brotherhood and the Muslim Brotherhood um, um, derivatives, which are Hamas, which are the Islamic Jihad, which are the ISIS and Al-Qaeda and Jabhat al-Nusra and all the terror organizations which came out from the womb of the Muslim Brotherhood. And by the way, there are people in all kinds of places in the world who think that the Muslim Brotherhood is a peaceful organization. You know, their emblem has two, two uh, uh, swords uh, of the Muslim Brotherhood. So what do you mean? One sword of the kisses and one sword of the hugs, okay? So this is the Muslim Brotherhood. And Qatar became a Muslim Brotherhood supporter, means terror supporter. They support Hamas, they support the, uh, Al Qaeda, they support all kinds of organizations which uh, are uh, defined 
in many places in the world as terror organizations. And this is what happened. And because of Karadawi, the Sheikh Karadawi, who changed the mindset of the former ruler of, uh, of uh, Qatar. And Qatar and, and Al Jazeera is actually the mouthpiece of the Muslim Brotherhood, in English as well, not only in Arabic. So uh, this is definitely what makes Qatar some kind of, um, I would say, leprak country uh, in the eyes of the Saudis and the Emiratis. Next question is from uh, Steven Gertzoff. Um, given the fact that uh, this, um, many people attribute this deal to uh, the common threat of Iran, what would happen to this deal, to this peace agreement, after the Iran um, issue is neutralized? Well, in order to answer this question, I have to be a prophet. And uh, <laughs> with all the respect, I'm not yet. Maybe in the future. Uh, I don't know. It all depends on how much they will need this peace with Israel. And you know what plays the role in the world is not uh, sentiments and not the moral, um, moral issues. Everything is about interests. This we already learned from the guru of the international relations, Hans Morgenthau, who in the 60s taught us that the main the main uh, element which determines international uh, relations is the interests. And maybe some other things uh, much lower in the, on, the, on the scale, but the interests, uh, 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 they are the, as long as they have the interest to continue peace with us, uh, whether it's economic interest or whatever interest, uh, it's good. When they will lose the interest, they will lose the peace as well. Okay, so one, uh, one more question from our uh, national board member, Cheryl Silver. Um, are you concerned about uh, the fact that President Trump uh, is going to sell F-35 fighter jets to the UAE? Um, and because we heard that a few Israeli leaders are um, concerned about this. Yes. Uh, first of all, um, the F-35, the range of its flight is... 1,100 kilometers without fueling in the air. Uh, Israel is almost 2,000 kilometers from the UAE. Therefore, without fueling, and they, don't, and they still don't have the ability to fuel in the air, they cannot actually reach Israel. So from this point of view, we are not afraid. I Iran is in the range because they are right across from the uh, uh, Persian Gulf. So Iran is in the range while Israel is not. This one thing. Second thing, the F-35 is a very good carrier. It's a vehicle. Depends what you put on it. Which aviation, which uh, uh, bombs, which um, ammunition, and everything else. And this is what makes the difference. It's not the vehicle. It's the payload which you put on it. As long as the payload which Israel has is better, uh, we still have the, the advantage on what they have. Of course, uh, we should, you know, be, be very careful. And uh, as you might know, Israeli, Israeli technology is embedded in the, these airplanes. So uh, if things go bad with the uh, Emirates, Israel can object, for example, supplying spare parts to these airplanes, and an airplane without a spare part is, could be maybe uh, in the museum, maximum, because you need all the time to change all kinds of parts because of the flight. Thank you. Um, so um, thank you, Dr. Kedar. So one more uh, thing. Um, we're, we're having a few more events coming up. Uh, you can check your chat. Um, you can check the links in the chat. September 16th, uh, there's going to be an event, uh, 1 p.m. And so our uh, ZOA Florida um, chapter is going to have a very interesting event called Making uh, the Terrorist, How Attorney Stephen Pearls get, Gets It Done, um, and, and many other events. Again, um, thank you, everybody, for, for showing up. Like I said before, uh, we're one organization that is uh, against the tide, against uh, a, a lot of forces, very funded forces, 
we're hoping we're we're hoping for your help. We hope we hope that you support us. We only have a few months left um, left until the end of the year. And again, thank you. Tell your friends about ZOA. Uh, we would love everybody to join to join to join the fight for Israel. I'm very pr proud to be part of this organization. Uh, like Dr. Mordechai Kedar said, many I have many Israeli friends, and they all tell me that uh, they are so grateful to have an American organization that stands stands up for Israel without. Uh, without an apology, and uh, no one will silence us. With your help, no one will silence us. So thank you, everybody, and have a Shana Tova from us at ZOA, and uh, we hope to hear more good news just like today. Thank you. Thank you so much.